speak to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When my divinity school classmate, Sean, began his married life, he followed a call into service as a parish priest in Saskatchewan. It was a charming farming community, and as you can imagine, there was a lot of driving involved. On Sundays, he had a 10 a.m. service and went home for a quick lunch and then left at noon for the 1.30 service in the next point. It was a 45-kilometer drive, about 40% of it on gravel roads. After that, he drove another 35 kilometers on gravel to a 3.30 p.m. service, and when that concluded, he headed home for supper at 6. Let's just say he came to know the inside of his car very well. A couple of years into his ministry at West, Sean met a man called Marvin, who had started a Christian bookstore in one of the neighboring towns. This was years before chapters thought of putting Starbucks in their bookstores, but Marvin always had a pot of coffee on, and Sean got into the habit of stopping in there from time to time when he was going back and forth on his pastoral calls. Marvin always was glad to see him and began to give him books for free. Got a little embarrassing after a while, Sean remembered saying to him one day, Marvin, the Christian bookstore business in this part of the country cannot be very lucrative. You're never going to make much of a profit if you keep giving me books for free. And Marvin just smiled and said, I know, but I'm having a lot of fun doing it. Marvin, you see, had discovered the secret of selfish generosity. Sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? What do I mean by selfish generosity? Well, let's just take a few minutes to explore the idea together. Our epistle that Anne just read today is the last part of a unit in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians a church that Paul had founded himself just years before. And in these chapters, Paul is writing to his friends in Corinth, encouraging them to get involved in a giant fundraising project that he's organizing for the benefit of the poor in Jerusalem. And we know that if there is one phrase that sums up the theme of these two chapters, it would be God loves a cheerful giver. We're all human. So for most of us, our natural tendency is to be givers with a grudge. Jesus, on the other hand, is constantly working on renovating our hearts, on transforming us. Jesus wants for us to learn that one of the great secrets to a joyful and happy life is generosity. When we read the text, we understand that there is an obvious payoff for the Jerusalem Christians in the Corinthians' generosity. But is there a payoff for the Corinthians too? Is their giving for their benefit as well as Jerusalem's? Paul thinks it is, and he spells it out. He spells out that particular payoff in our passage today. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of us must give as we have made up our mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide us with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, we may share abundantly in every good work. Now, I'd suggest that this is not the normal way that we think of giving to charity. We've all received those phone calls from cancer research or sick kids asking for a donation of $100 or more. And if I'm honest, my first thought is usually this. Do I have an extra $100, and what had I planned on spending that $100 on? In a way, I'm now in competition with the charity. 
If I keep the money, it is of benefit to me. If I give it to them, it will be a benefit to them, which will probably be a good thing, but I won't get anything out of it at all. Paul challenges this type of thinking. He says, the farmer who plants seeds in the ground isn't making a donation. He's making an investment. The food he's able to grow will be a benefit to others because they'll be able to eat and not starve. But it will also be a benefit to the farmer because it will bring him an income. So Paul's challenging us to rethink our perspective on generosity. My gifts to the poor are not a donation. They're an investment in the work of God's kingdom. That work will benefit other people, but it will also benefit me. I'm not just giving gifts. I'm sowing seeds. And in good time, I'll be able to reap a harvest. Now in our reading, Paul points out three ways that this thinking will benefit us. First, he promises that if we are generous to others, God will provide for our needs as well. Verse 8 says, and God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Verses 10 and 11. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity. Listen carefully to what Paul says here. He doesn't make an unconditional promise that God will give us everything we want. In fact, in other places in the New Testament, Paul works hard to reduce the list of things that we want. And he isn't saying that God will reward us by giving us material things. He's saying that God will generously provide for all that we need. And then we will always have everything we need and plenty left over to share with others. Now we're starting to see God's priority. It's not that I'll be able to buy an even nicer or more expensive car. It's that I'll always have enough to provide for my basic needs and then to continue to be generous to the poor. It's not an extravagant payoff, but it is still a payoff. So we're promised that God will look after our needs and that this will bring about righteousness in our lives. It'll give us a righteous character. If we allow the Holy Spirit to shape us into the kind of people whose greatest joy is to be generous toward others, toward those in need, that is a benefit that will be with us forever. So God will provide for our needs, and we will have the lasting benefit of a righteous character. But there's yet another benefit the benefit of prayer of those that we've helped. I think possibly the most wonderful gift anyone can give us is to pray for us, to intercede on our behalf. As I sit in worship here with you week by week, I listen to our intercessors leading the prayers of the people, and I am humbled. Each week, Our cyber prayer group gets together and offers prayers for the broken, for the hurting in our parish, and for those desiring to draw closer to the heart of God. I'm especially grateful to those who pray for our staff and our leadership, our wardens, for those who pray for the vision and the ministry of St. Timothy's and for the community around us. You can't put a dollar value on that, it's priceless. So it looks like there's a benefit for our growth as joyful givers. God will provide for our needs. We'll grow in righteous character. And when the poor receive our gifts, their hearts will overflow with thanksgiving to God, and they'll offer prayer to us, for us. Now 
when we are ready to give of ourselves and our first fruits. Paul's first guideline to us is to give generously. The second guideline is to give freely. It's possible to give generously with the hand, but to continue to grasp the gift with your heart and to wish you'd never given it in the first place. We've all been there. That sort of generosity may be a benefit to the recipient, but it won't be a benefit to the giver. Paul reminds us that no one can judge another Christian for how much they give, money or otherwise. I mean, it's true in the Old Testament, 10% is the standard, but what's important is not a legalistic attachment to the percentages. What's important is that our hearts are transformed so that we become the sort of people whose greatest joy is generosity. And when that happens, percentages will be unimportant. We'll be giving all the time because it brings us joy. And that leads to Paul's third guideline. So we give generously, give freely, give cheerfully. God isn't trying to make us all into miserable people who can't even buy an ice cream cone for ourselves without feeling guilty about all the poor people who could have been helped by that $4.50. No. God is longing to increase our joy. He wants to make us happier, more cheerful people. And he knows that generosity is an infallible way to do that. The question for us today is, are we ready? Are we ready to experience more of that joy in our lives? Do we want that sense of satisfaction? Do we want to be able to sleep at night with a sense of joy in having made a real difference in the lives of another person? And I really believe God wants that for us. This Thanksgiving weekend, as we gather with our little social bubbles, as we gather with our family at home, let us pray that the Holy Spirit will change and transform our hearts to reflect his generosity. We know we cannot outgive our God. We are so incredibly blessed. So with grateful hearts, full of praise and wonder for our Creator, let's give thanks. Amen.